Okay, hey everybody, good evening. Welcome to <clears throat> the 15th of October, 2020. Uh, and obviously new 302, I think. I think you know that. Um, okay, so I have a few things uh, I wanna go over um, quickly today um, before I sort of jump in. Also, uh, I, I am trying to have an ongoing eye to not burying you guys in an excess amount of work. And I was speaking to one of your peers um, and I had already had this niggling idea about, you know, like, er, you know, a couple of weeks ago I had, a, you know, that was like watch a film and also here are two hours of lecture and also here are peer presentations. And it's like, okay, so I don't want to bury people. Um, so with that in mind, okay, I'm going to restrict myself to talking um, to just an hour uh, this week. I will resume, um, I will resume uh, putting out more material next week, but uh, it's really, really crucial that you watch Marwan Call. So that's the first thing that I'm going to say. Uh, it is crucial that you watch Marwan Call. In fact, of all of the films that we take up, I think Marwan Call is the sort of most centrally useful. And it's not that the analysis of um, fiction isn't highly useful to Jungian practice, right? That interpretive frame and the ability to, to see those dynamics, right? There's obviously a direct link, as I pointed out in a very real sense, we as human beings are made of stories. And so doing analysis on stories in archetypal terms is an extremely useful part of the work. There's a reason that doing analysis on myths and fairy tales, you know, is sort of a long-standing depth psychological endeavor. Um, however, Marwin Call is a documentary and although obviously, right, the, the um, sort of protagonist, main character, the subject of the documentary, uh, Mark Hogan Camp, uh, did suffer brain insult. And so, you know, you might imagine that he is um, not wholly neurotypical on that account. Nevertheless, the dynamics that I think you can see, even with a relatively casual interpretation of Marwan Call, are... Uh, striking. Um, I saw that film first a number of years ago, possibly at Hot Docs, um, uh, with, in fact, an analyst in training that I was friends with, and, uh, um, and found it immediately powerfully uh, striking. I have since both seen it and screened it a number of times, and it's become sort of one of the touchstones um, for this course. Uh, I think it has kind of that level of significance. So it's important that you watch that, and therefore I'm going to endeavor not to bury you. You'll also note there are no student presentations this week. As far as the student presentations are concerned thus far, it's really, really important that you um, engage with your peers, okay? So if you haven't, jump uh, onto the discussions. Um, I love the level of enthusiasm on the discussions. You may want to foreshorten those a little bit. It's not that I don't actually like the long answers, I do, but simultaneously I am aware that, you know, for every sort of four paragraph answer, we're adding four paragraphs to the sum total of what everybody sort of needs to read to catch up. And that can be intimidating, I think, to get into the conversation. So I'm gonna say from here, try to contain your uh, responses to like, two paragraphs, you know, on any given bounce. I don't want to throttle back engagement. I'm thrilled, in fact, to see people discussing this stuff, talking around. I'm going to jump in there and make a bunch of comments today, today being Thursday. Uh, so I'm going to make a bunch of comments today. Um, yeah, so I don't want to throttle anybody's enthusiasm, but, you know, constrain it, compress it just a little bit. You know, brevity is the soul of wit, uh, as Shakespeare says. So, um, yeah, just pull it back just because, again, I have it front and center for all of you that, um, that, that I, don't want, I don't want this course to be burdensome. <clears throat> Frankly, to the extent that the course is burdensome, it runs exactly opposite the goals of the course. If you can't approach the material in a certain kind of open-minded and reflective stance, you're not going to get out of it right? I think what, um, what you might otherwise find valuable. So, um, so I'm not interested in squeezing you guys in a diamond press. So I am dialing down my output a little bit accordingly, um, contra my uh, natural impulses. And uh, I just asked that for your responses. It's super important and crucial that you do jump in on response questions, especially for your, your peers topics, but try to foreshorten just a little bit just so that people aren't kind of freaked out uh, and intimidated. The other aspect of participation that's absolutely crucial, okay, is um, 
uh, is the, the, the quizzes, okay? So the quizzes are your opportunity to give direct anonymous feedback to your peers. I will keep track of who responds, okay? And you need to do so in a relatively timely fashion um, because uh, I use those in the feedback that I send to people on their presentations when they get their grade and to some extent, right? I wanna have all that together. So again, like I said, I'm not a tyrant about having to respond within two days or something, but like, you know, within a couple of weeks it's reasonable for you to be able to, to drop some, some numbers and some notes, okay? So it's really important that you do that. Um, uh, so that's point two. Uh, and what is point three? Point three. There was something else. Oh, I know. I just wanted to reiterate, um, cause I had a conversation with, with one of your classmates yesterday and it led me to believe that maybe this isn't clear. So just to be clear, um, some of you obviously already know this, but, uh, I, I am available on, at my zoom address every Thursday night from six to seven thirty PM for discussion. There is no particular discussion. It's like people lob questions out and then I give answers that are slightly too long or sometimes very too long. Um, but I try to answer those questions um, or, or at the very least kind of stir discussion and try to get things going, okay? So we're in early days, but the longer we go, the more free flowing that's gonna be. Um, so those aren't mandatory. You don't have to come. There's nothing requiring, I'm not gonna twist your arm. They're there for your benefit only. So if you have questions to ask, it's a good time to ask them. Um, so every Thursday, obviously standard Eastern time, 6 p.m. to 7.30, I am available at my Zoom address along with a bunch of the other students at a group exercise. I am also available noon to 1.30, uh, noon to 1.30 p.m. standard Eastern time on Fridays, and that's office hours. Um, office hours are open unless somebody specifically requests close time. And if you need to discuss something sensitive, um, uh, obviously, uh, I'm happy to find close time. And if neither of those times works for you, those are every week, but if neither of those times works for you, reach out to me. Uh, I'm, I'm a busy guy for sure, but with a little bit of advance notice and juggling, I do have a fair bit of control over my schedule and I'm totally happy to, to find half an hour you know, somewhere uh, in my week uh, where we can connect, where that works for you and we can discuss things. Okay. So I uh, just wanted to iterate uh, those things in terms of sort of participation and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so endeavoring not to bury you. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, something else that I wanted to address really quickly, just because I know that it's coming up and so people will have it on their mind, um, which is the, um, uh, the, I was going to say annotated bibliography, but I mean annotated glossary. So the annotated glossary assignment is coming up. That's, so it'll be next week. You'll submit it on Quarkus. Uh, I am not counting by the minute whether or not it's like, did you get it in by midnight or 1201? That's not what I'm doing, okay? And, and like the odds that I'm actually gonna mark it on Thursday night are approximately zero. However, obviously, if you think it's gonna be late, you need to let me know, right? Because I don't want things to trail out excessively long, partly because it places a burden on me if I get a whole pile up of work later, and partly because I actually, as, as a procrastinator myself, I understand what it is like for these things to place this burden on you. You kick the can down the road and that's temporary relief, but then in the long term, what you end up with is a cluster of more work down the road. So I understand assignments are coming due, um, there is some flexibility there if you talk to me, if you talk to me, but otherwise it's due next week. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, obviously I went through this a bit, but I'm gonna go through it again because uh, every year I get questions and so, you know, whatever, might as well address this in broad strokes first. Okay, so you're gonna pick five separate Jungian terms, okay? You're gonna pick five separate Jungian terms. One of those terms, one of the five, must be self, the self. One of them must be, okay? The other four, you can, you can pick, okay? There is nothing, you're, you're not gonna be penalized for going, you know, an absolute, um, you know, slow pitch route and picking like, you know, ego, persona, shadow, anima or animus self. 
If that's what you want to do, that's fine. In fact, that's what many people do, and that's, that's totally acceptable. But it may be the case that there are other specific terms that you're really interested in, right? You might be interested in complexes, or you might be interested in the transcendent function, or you might be interested in um, you know, a particular archetype that you've come across in your reading. Um, you might be interested in you know, eros or thanatos or libido or synchronicity. The only thing that I will say in that respect is, to the extent that you pick something that's relatively like you have an abundance of material, you know, you're going to end up with a slightly clearer assignment. If you pick something that's, you know, farther out, you know, be aware that necessarily those concepts are going to be, you know, more esoteric and possibly harder to grasp. Now for you, that might be your jam. If you are just like, damn, I want to do synchronicity. Okay. I'm not going to stop you. That's fine. Right. That's it's a union term. It's acceptable and whatever. Um, but if you're like, oh, I should stay inside the comfort zone. Let's talk about, you know, the, these things that we've already had some discussion around. That's also fine. Okay. So you got to pick four plus self basically. So it's five, each one, put it on its own page. Okay. I understand that you'll be submitting this electronically, but it's sort of for readability purposes. And the format of each page is the same. You're going to put one paragraph, Okay, which is composed of Jung's definitions. Do not just take a block quote and slide it in there. I want you to sort of stitch Frankenstein style. I want you to stitch together a bunch of his comments into a kind of block. Okay, you can separate them by ellipsis, dot, 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 if you want. Okay, but the point is, you know, you're, you're looking to construct it. If I guess you found like an absolute paragraph, right? Then you could just use that and sort of cite where you're pulling it from. But odds are you're gonna want to composite it. That's your first paragraph. That is like the first third of the page, okay? Second paragraph, second third of the page, okay? Is taking that definition and putting it into your own words. So I wanna hear you explain the concept, okay? So the first one is like, can you find the material for what you're looking for and assemble it into something sensible? The second one is, okay, and now can you tell me in your own words? Tell me in your own words is an assignment that we have all been doing since grade school. And the reason is that tell me in my own words is a relatively surefire way of understanding that you are getting to, either you have an excellent command of the thesaurus or you're getting to a deeper level of comprehension, right? The idea being that if you have, if you can express something, right, fluidly in your own words, right, then you've accessed sort of the underlying meaning behind the words, okay, that's important. So that is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a degree of comprehension that, that bounces off, right, what you've constructed and shows that you know what you're talking about, that you have researched and understood this concept, okay, and understood it as much as is reasonable and as much as anybody can, right, there are mysterious edges, but you see where I'm, where I'm going, okay, so that's paragraph two. Paragraph three, it says one or two, so that's a little variable, but the idea is the last third, okay, of the page is a couple of paragraphs where you're talking about your understanding of it, okay, uh, as it appears in course imaginative works or other sources of examples we discussed, or your personal examples, okay? I'm not making your personal examples mandatory because everybody has a different um, level of comfort with self-disclosure, okay? But obviously there are cases where, uh, and you know, you've seen me use some and you'll see me use more, cases where one's own anecdotal experience is actually an extremely powerful illustrative touch point, right? Um, it's a kind of anchor that you can point at. And very often, in fact, until you have an experience with something, um, it's, you know, you don't quite get it. You have it on a theoretical level, but you don't sort of get it in your bones. So that third paragraph, you can reference an imaginative work. It can be one of the ones we've talked about. It can be something else, as long as you give me some understanding of what you're talking about, right? You, you make the comparison. Um, it could be related sources. It could be other examples we've talked about. And it could, can also be your own experience, right? You can illustrate with your own experience. Bearing in mind that, again, the purpose is, is, is for you to... Um, you know, demonstrate understanding here. And this is about connecting it through to a kind of animated, a living example, right? So that living example might be fiction and that living example might be nonfiction and that living example might be, you know, autobiographical nonfiction, right? It might be your own life or the life of somebody you've known or circumstances or something of that kind, okay? So three paragraphs on each page, five pages, one of them has to be the self, okay? Um, it should be pretty straightforward for people. Okay, um, but obviously if you have questions, ask 
questions. Ask questions either from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday or noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday. Okay, so that's that. Um, okay, so I think that's all the core administrative, administrative material that I can think of. So I'm going to take my remaining 45 minutes and I'm going to talk a bit about um, projection. Okay. So we have already discussed projection to a significant extent when we've been talking a little bit and you've heard me talk about shadow projection. So an example that I like to use a lot about shadow projection, right, is the projection that I had on somebody when I took this course many years ago, where I experienced sort of an irrational and disproportionate, okay, and that often indicates the presence of, of projection or complex, irrational and disproportionate. So I had an irrational and disproportionate um, upsurge of feeling towards this individual who I in fact did not know, right? There were a few key things there, a few key hooks that managed to, right, sort of attract my projection or that I could hang my projection on. But in fact, as an individual, I did not know them. This was part of the, my reasoning for going and introducing myself and getting to know them because getting to know them was right and really paying attention, not just tracking my projection, right? Was part and parcel of separating that individual out from the projection, okay? So I've already talked about this a bit. Projection, however, is, um, you know, is a very broad mechanism. And I'll tell you about a, a few more instances. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about something that in fact is going to sort of lead into um, lead into the material around around Marwan call and you'll see it a bit. Okay, so the first instance that I want to talk about um, is, uh, in fact, uh, was a kind of a clinical uh, example. I may have already brought this up, but it, it's worth telling anyway. I, everything blends because it's all on video. I can't, I sometimes can't separate whether or not I've talked about something in a lecture or whether or not I've talked something in office hours or I've talked about it in a discussion. It's, it's, uh, uh, the, the boundaries are a little blurry for me, but anyway, okay. So here's the example. So when I started seeing my analyst a number of years ago, right, I had quite, um, I had quite, I'd taken some pains to sort of select an analyst that I thought would be a good fit. And I had a specific idea in mind. The thing is you have to go through a course of analysis before you can train as an analyst. And that was my very specific goal at the time. My very specific goal was I need to start accumulating hours with in analysis, right? So that I have stuff backstopped if I decide uh, to pursue uh, analyst training, right? That was my very specific goal. Now, it wasn't, of course, that I didn't have, uh, you know, a bunch of other issues and things that I wanted to pursue, but I did have the, frankly, ego-driven and, um, in hindsight, erroneous uh, idea that mostly I was just processing that stuff through by myself. I wanted an analyst who, um, who I felt was sort of quite uh, bright, right? I wanted somebody that I felt like I could um, talk freely about, you know, a variety of subjects and frames and lenses and stuff without having to restrict myself. Um, so some, somebody with a background that it was somewhat comparable to my own, you know, who could um, play in science, but also literature. So I, you know, I wanted somebody fairly kind of, um, you know, a Renaissance person or something, right? Um, and obviously I wanted somebody that I felt had a really strong grasp on Jung. Um, and, and indeed the recommendation that I got from my friend who, who was an analyst to another analyst uh, turned out to be a terrific fit. So I did, however, go in with this idea that there wasn't anything that he was bringing to the table that was sort of fundamentally distinct from what I was bringing to the table. Now, in a certain sense, that's true. It's not that you can't work through your own psychological material on your own. You can, but working with somebody else, especially a dedicated professional who knows their way around, uh, can represent a really um, remarkable shortening of the way. Right? It can help you facilitate um, insights, particularly transformative insights. Okay? It can help you build skills. It can set the space and time aside that you need to work on things. And the fact is, like putting some money on the barrel doesn't hurt either. When I was in undergrad, my, um, uh, my, my budget was rent first, uh, analysis second. Analysis was my second high, highest cost. I believe it came in above school. It cost me more than school did. Um, and it was something that I prioritized, right? And despite the financial expense, because 
I knew that putting some money down on it would sort of um, highlight it. It would foreground it. It would make it salient to me. It's like you're much less likely to skip a session if you know you've got a hundred bucks or something or 150 bucks on the line. Um, so yeah, so you know, and so I I would get myself to go. So. A lot of those factors I was aware of, but the general psychological work stuff, I pretty much thought I was more or less on top of. Um, and I had some interesting examples that disabused me of that um, early in the, in the first summer that I was working um, with my analyst. Uh, so, you know, in, in one case, I, I had this dream and I was lucky. I lived about 10, 10 or 12 minutes on foot from my analyst, which was kind of glorious because it meant that even with a morning session, I could more or less roll, you know, blearily straight out of bed, you know, pull clothes on and then like zombie myself into the office and plunk myself down while the dreams were still fresh. Um, and before my rational uh, ego had begun to sort of really like engage its gears and before I'd had a chance to really construct my persona, um, this made a big difference. Uh, so, um, <laughs> during, during the summer, I often went twice a week. Uh, and so I would often go during a morning and an evening slot. And the difference was remarkable, right? The morning slot, I was very raw, right? Very open. The evening slot, I was far more constructed. And that had its own uses, but like I'd already been through the whole day. I had had, I'd already put my armor on, right? And been, been through the whole day. And so the person who was interacting in those evening sessions was different. But this was a morning session. And so I was a little raw, a little bleary. I hadn't even had my first cup of coffee. And I have this dream. And I don't know what to make of it. And I really don't know what to make of it. Like it's completely, it's, I have no idea what to make of it. So I go in and I tell him this dream. And immediately he's like, oh, and I got to see the first instance of him deploying sort of his superpower. Uh, my analyst loved dream work. Um, and so he would become very engaged with it and he was extremely sharp. And so as we began to pull the themes out, I was just wowed. Like I watched him sort of deconstruct this thing mid air, you know, like, uh, like uh, Iron Man designing something on this interface. It's just like taking my dream apart. And in that moment, I remember looking and thinking that, you know, that I want to learn that. Um, so that, that was sort of a, a breakwater moment. And it's interesting because thereafter, right, our relationship, um, you know, proceeded, uh, you know, through some standard stuff. Now, one thing that you may know, okay, about transference is that there's a fairly standard set of transferences that occurs um, in therapeutic relationship quite often, okay? It's not invariable, but it occurs quite often, okay? So one of these you may be familiar is like, it's standard in Freudian theory for the idea that the transference, okay, the transference, which is the projection of the client onto the therapist, very often carries a parental character. That's pretty common, okay? Very often carries this parental character. So there, there becomes this period of time where the client is very often transferring parental material, right? They, they feel a parental kind of vibe, right? Um, and I had my, my first taste of this when uh, I was sitting and it was like August. So this was a couple of months after our dream thing. And I'm sitting in the waiting room. It's hot. It was hot. Uh, and I'm sitting in there and I'm kind of like, I'm sweating because I've just walked down and it's hot and the air conditioning is woefully inadequate to the task of cooling the space. And I'm waiting for session. And I have this thought, I thought that pops into my head. And the thought is, you know, ah, oh, it's too bad we have to sit here. You know, like we're going to have to sit and talk in this hot room. Like it would be nice if we could just like, I don't know, you know, go for a walk or grab a spot of lunch and a beer or go to the park and throw a ball around. And I have this thought and I catch it immediately. I'm like, throw a ball around? Like what? Um, now this is hilarious because I don't, <laughs> uh, I don't, throw, I don't throw balls around. I'm not, uh, I'm not a very sporty fellow. I come from a non-sporty family and I am myself non-sporty. Um, you know, I have, I have other interests, um, but sports involving throwing balls around were not really a big part of my life. Um, although I always wish I'd joined the football team and that's another story. But, uh, yeah, so I think to myself, like, throw a ball around. Like, I've never thrown a ball around with my own father in my life. And it would, had never even occurred to me to do so. It's not an activity that he would enjoy. It's not an activity that I would enjoy. I think my grandfather threw me a few pitches one time until I got a bloody nose and then decided I wasn't likely to be a baseball player. Um, when I was like eight. Uh, 
so I have this thought, right? Throw a ball around. And when he opens up the door and I come into session, um, you know, he opens up the door and I usher in, I'm already laughing. Um, as you'll see, it's a fairly common theme for me that when I have uh, some kind of connective uh, insight about my own psyche, it often causes me to laugh. Um, I often find it really funny because it, it hits me strongly. But in this case, I'm laughing. And so I promptly explained it to him. And in that way, we frankly defused. We pulled back a lot of the projection that would have been part of the transference that particular phase, the parental transference. Now, transference and the kind of projection that occurs between client and therapist is almost impossible because transference, it's impossible to avoid because transference, right, projection, uh, the projection of the client towards the therapist and counter-transference, the projection of the therapist towards the client is actually a pretty integral part of the work. It's a pretty integral part of the work. In fact, you know, for, for Freudians, and I think that this is one of the areas where they really nailed something, they believe that it is in fact in that, it's in that locus. It's in the locus of that projected parental material, for instance, that things um, happen, right? That's where the possibility for transformation really inheres, is precisely in that projection. And I think you'll see that indeed, right, doing work with projections um, can lead to some um, impressive and often sort of counterintuitive psychological transformations, okay? So, um, yeah. So I, I think that's an interesting instance because it did sort of pretty immediately pop the, the sort of frontline potential for it to be like a, a father-son kind of relationship between us. And, um, uh, and I had definitely felt that kind of thing before, right? So my friend, the analyst, who had been a young prof, there was no question that I had a certain kind of paternal projection towards um, this fellow. He was, um, you know, sort of a charming and English and knowledgeable and, right? And it's not that I don't, you know, obviously like and love my own father, but this guy represented, you know, a certain, he was like the father to the person that I wanted to be. Um, in a way. In fact, the first time that I ever um, met with him and had office hours, I, I gushed and I sent him a, a kind of cringy and overlong email where I was talking, right? Because I felt seen and because finally I felt like, oh, wow, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm home in some important sense. Um, and it took me a while to lance that so that we could become friends, right? Because friendship requires equality if you've got a projection of parental stuff, right? And you know, the parental projection that's, that occurs within therapy often, in fact, gives way. Often things start as a parental projection. It's not uncommon for that projection to become highly erotic there afterwards. And when I use the term eros, I don't just mean sexual, but sometimes, of course, the projection and the counter projection does contain eros, right? One of the reasons why we've had to have a modern prohibition um, against therapists becoming, you know, romantically involved with their clients, and there are strong, strong rules and prohibitions about this these days, is precisely because it happens. And in a way, you can kind of see why. For lots of people, their therapeutic relationship may be the most intimate relationship in their life, right? In the sense of emotional intimacy, in the sense of feeling comfortable in terms of bearing themselves. It may be the most emotionally intimate relationship in their life even if they have emotional intimacy elsewhere, okay, even, you know, with the partner or partners. Um, nevertheless, there is a certain quality to it, right? Because many therapists, most, I would say, um, practice uh, a standard of sort of non-judgmental interaction, right? There's a, there's a, a sort of a standard of non-judgment non there. And to be non, to have a conversation that's non-judgmental, right? To not feel stressed, uh, about social judgment and to know that things are contained is it's all a powerful experience. People that do not expect to, ha to have it be a powerful experience are often surprised, right? So a thing that I am told with all, great frequency, okay, in like a first or second uh, session, if I'm uh, meeting a new client, it's like, wow, I'm talking about all this stuff I didn't expect to talk about. Like, th this isn't something I talk about. And you can imagine there's a tremendous amount of interior pressure, right, that's sort of built up there that's receiving a kind of cathartic release. Um, so that's a powerful relationship. And so, yeah, it starts in this parental thing. There's always this authoritative quality. It doesn't matter how 
um, sort of soft and inclusive and whatever you are typically as a therapist, there is always this respect quality typically that starts things. And that tends to shift itself into this parental, the, the, the client, the patient is on, you know, their best behavior. That stuff starts to break down over time as you do the work, right? And often in a good way, you know, in a way that reveals the humanity of both parties, but it can, because of that intimacy, give way to a different kind of projection, an erotic projection. And that projection can be you know, sexual, sexual attraction or romantic attraction. So it's not uncommon for patients to report, right? That they, to, at least periodically, like they've fallen in love with their therapist. It is also not uncommon for therapists, okay, to experience, um, you know, feelings towards clients. Uh, and that's something that, of course, there's training to manage, right? That they have to, you know, be explicitly concerned with. And of course, if it becomes undue, then obviously they can't, can't work with that client, right? Because it would be transgressive. But, um, but a lot of the time, it's just part of the field. And my own analyst um, has a, a real um, strong interest in sort of this projective field of, of Eros. Um, and the way that he's talked about it, I mean, he talks about a, a conference that he attended and, you know, thinking about Eros, not just as sort of sexy energy, sexy attraction, but just as attraction right, as that quality of attraction, right? Eros is a, is a possessive love. So, you know, within Greek, there are a few different words of love. English, English is a very poor language in that respect. A rich language in many respects, but, um, but in this respect, poor. Which is to say we have one word for love, and it's like, I love my grandma, I love my, you know, uh, dog, I love chocolate chip cookies, I love my boyfriend, I love, right? You mean different things when you're using this word, love. Um, yeah, Greek, on the other hand, has this variety even of terms for human love, okay? And so there is the, um, you know, uh, love of the parent for a child, and there is the love between friends. Those are agape and philia, uh, respectively. So agapic love is the love of parent for child or the love of God for created beings, okay? It's a creating love, right? So the agopic love projects towards the being, and, but really like when you love a baby, initially speaking, the baby doesn't strictly speaking love you back because it's kind of a, you know, it's like a blob. It doesn't, it's not really there. But the point is, if you love at that baby and you love it in the right way, you turn it into a being, right? Like love is prerequisite to, to beinghood, right? Humans who are starved of love often have serious problems, right? Developmental problems, emotional problems, etc. Relationship problems. Um, okay, so that's agapic love, right? And then there's phileia. This is the love of friends. Uh, and then fundamentally, it's, it's a fellowship. It's, a, it's an, uh, a love based in equality, right? If there's sort of a power imbalance in it, phileia can't obtain. But then there is eros, okay? And eros is erotic love, it's possessive, it's consumptive. Now that's not always bad, okay? It's not always bad. You can see it expressed when people say of babies, oh, I just wanna eat you up. There's a term for that in a few different languages. I can't remember what it is, but it's related to the urge that people have sometimes to pinch and hurt small children. It's not really that they wanna hurt them, but there's this upflow of feeling and it's just like, ah, just, right? And people are like, ah, I just wanna eat you up. That consumptive quality that possessive quality is really central to Eros. And of course, the same thing infuses sexual uh, attraction, often romantic attraction, right? The, the idea that people have very often, right? Which they, they, to some extent get culturally trained into, but to some extent it's sort of natural that when they are interested in somebody sexually, that there is an element of, you know, I don't know, to, to conquer or be conquered, right? To be possessed or to possess to whatever. Now, for some people that rubs them the wrong way right away, right? And that's a whole thing on attachment that we'll talk about later. But the point is that it often has that quality, which is of course why erotic love so often is also tangled together with jealousy, right? Because when you have that, that feeling, right? It's, it's desirous and possessive um, to a certain extent, okay? Now, the point is that, that part of what that Eros field does is it puts salience on things, right? So when you are interested in somebody, and this can be a romantic or sexual interest or just a, I don't know, you know, it's how we don't have good words for this, like a, a curiosity, right? When you're interested in somebody, when you're fascinated is a good word, when you're fascinated by them, they seem to take on a certain kind of glow. And sometimes that's a function of, you know, charisma, um, which definitely is a, is a thing. Um, so sometimes it's a function of charisma, 
but much of the time, uh, you know, it just, it has to do with this, this projection, this projection of, of arrows that you have, that they have a kind of glow, a kind of otherworldly quality, uh, like a pull on the gaze, okay? And that field operates in a really powerful way, you know, in, um, in analytical exchanges, in therapeutic exchanges, except it becomes an interest field. So like, really, if you are going to be somebody's therapist, you have to be interested in them. I mean, that's sort of an underplayed thing. They don't teach that in training generally that I'm familiar with, but you have to be interested in them. You have to kind of be a fan of them in a way, right? That doesn't mean, of course, that you, you know, you, you know, like roll over and let them do everything you want or you're, you give adulation to them or any such thing, right? In fact, often you have to build the relationship of trust and rapport up to the point that you are then comfortable holding their feet to the fire and pushing back because that sometimes becomes necessary, right? If, if you're trying to sort of steer them in certain ways, right? Or get them to steer themselves. Um, but nevertheless, you have to sort of be a fan. You have to be interested. You have to be interested in them. You, you need to pay really close attention. Like if you're not interested in people, therapist is not a job for you. And bearing in mind that if you're an introvert, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not interested in people. In fact, you may have an intense interest in their inner life. So I, um, I am intensely interested in people and their inner lives. I find individuals and individual lives fascinating. And I find them um, epic and tragic and right like the 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 weight lives don't seem small to me they're all really interesting um my former business partner and i once had this conversation when he was uh crashing uh after parties at tiff a number of years ago and he was talking about i don't know dancing with Catherine zeta jones or something and i said to him you know sometimes when you're telling me these stories i have the sense that you feel like celebrities are are more interesting or better people than regular people and he said, they are. And I said, yeah, I, I don't think that. I just don't, like, I just don't, I don't agree. It's not that I don't think that they're interesting. I imagine they are interesting, but everybody's interesting. And see, when you, when you start to get to know somebody, that is to say, cut past whatever projection, categorical projection you've laid on them to be like, well, there are this, so I don't have to think about it anymore, right? When you cut through that and you start to get towards their individuality, what you find is, is, often incredibly intricate and moving. And it comes with it a kind of fascination. There is a field there, right? This, and, and that is a big part of the, the sort of eros, right? Um, if you're doing work with somebody, you're sort of fascinated by them and their lives and cheering for them a bit, right? Even at the same time as they're disclosing their, their wounds, their flaws, their shadow, right? Um, because with hopefully they are indeed disclosing their shadow. They're showing you in some points their darkest parts, but you are also evincing a kind of fascination for them and a hope for them and a belief, even that they sometimes don't hold, that transcendence is possible and growth is possible. And all of that is contained within this really powerful field. It can be quite difficult for therapists to break themselves away when they need to break themselves away. So for instance, it's easy for like other helping professions, right? Like social workers, case workers, it's easy to get burned out because you get emotionally involved. And if you have the kind of client who, right, you have to be able to pull back to preserve your own energies and your own material, their life is, right? And there are limits to how much you can be engaged or involved, but it's hard to manage. And therapists do tend to bring this stuff home. Right? And a lot of that is part of this, it's part of that field. You have to sort of shirk off the possessive components of it, but the fascination must remain. Okay, so that's sort of an interesting set of examples in terms of projection in that sense. There's one more kind of story I wanna tell that's a, a personal one. Some of you would have heard it in discussion or office hours, but I wanna retell it here because I think it's sort of illustrative and it's potentially illustrative as we start to move towards talking about um, mechanisms of projection and play and relating that a bit to Marwin Call. So, um, you know, when I was a, uh, a younger man, um, you know, in my twenties, I had had, you know, whatever, the relatively customary series of romantic train wrecks. They weren't all bad. Actually, I had, I had, I think actually quite good romantic luck, maybe some amalgam of good romantic taste and good romantic luck. My relationships were by and large actually quite good. 
Um, but nevertheless, like even a good relationship can have bad timing or it can be, you know, developmentally off in breakups, no matter, it is rare that a breakup isn't sort of painful and it doesn't leave a certain amount of wreckage, right? Um, and then, you know, coming into my mid twenties, I had a, you know, like a series of encounters that left me really uh, wounded in one way or another. And I was savvy enough to recognize how much of that was coming about from projection. That I was engaging in these really powerful projections in part because my early relationships were so powerful and were so reciprocated. Like my first serious relationship was, uh, was about 15 and I was lucky because it, you know, went, we're still friends. Actually, I'm going to see, <laughs> I'm going to see her and her husband and their kids. I'm running them a, a role-playing game online because uh, everything's online. But the point is like, we're still friends, um, she and I, but you know, at the time, this was a really intense, serious relationship that we fell, fell into together. And it went through serious times. You know, when we were 17, her parents independently of each other, about six months apart died. Um, and so, you know, I was really there um, with her when she was sort of, she was the eldest child and struggling to keep the family together. And it was intense, right? It was an intense love. There was intense tragedy. It was an intense period um, for both of us. And that left us tied together in lots of ways. And when I moved into my 20s, you know, I was to some extent looking for that kind of intensity, consciously or unconsciously. I was looking for something that was going to, right? And, you know, look and ye shall find. Like I would have these kinds of powerful projections, but what I found a bunch of times in my twenties was that I would have them and either they would be sort of unreciprocated or I would get involved and they would explode. Like they just weren't, it wasn't going well. And I was savvy enough to recognize it's like, oh, this is projections. Like I've been reading Jung long enough that I know what's happening here. So, uh, so, there were a couple of occasions where I decided, okay, I decided, that, that the goal was gonna to be to pull my projections back. And there is like a moment, right? When you start to get romantically interested in somebody, there is often this transitional moment. Sometimes it's a lightning strike. Sometimes it's love at first sight, which is inherently projective as I pointed out, right? Sometimes it's love at first sight. You spot somebody, you meet them and pew! You know, one of the instances I had of love at first sight, interestingly, was actually the second time I met somebody and she never, uh, she never ceased to remind me that I had met her earlier and somehow completely forgotten about this. <laughs> I had apparently socialized her with friends and had, hadn't even gone on my radar. But the second time we met, the second time we met, it hit me like a lightning bolt. And I walked away after we, you know, we had some drinks with these people. And I walked away with a friend of mine who was there also. And I said, like her, I'm going to date her. Uh, and his response was telling. Uh, he said, geez, I don't know, man. I think she's kind of a man eater. Uh, was what he said, um, which was an interesting sort of invocation of tiger imagery. Um, now, I don't know about that, but the point was that we did indeed have a quite tumultuous, um, we did indeed have a quite tumultuous relationship, rewarding in a lot of ways, but also like the Sturm und Drang, right? Uh, you know, so sound and thunder. Uh, you know, so a couple of times I decided, okay, I'm not going through this process. There is that moment right at the start where you can sort of feel the faint tickle of your complex, like, oh, am I about to project? This is interesting, you know? And if you let it go often, what will happen is you will start to obsessively orbit mentally around somebody, right? You'll start to think about them. You'll start thinking about them a lot. You'll start hitting sort of limerence, as the term is, right? Not lust per se, but limerence, a sort of obsessive circling. And, uh, and of course, you often start to mythologize them at the same time, right? You'll start to mythologize them. You'll start to mythologize the romantic potential of the situation. Uh, and of course, if you actually start getting together with them, you will be over the moon. And uh, if both of you are doing it, you will co-mythologize. You will form a little cozy cult between the two of you a lot of the time. And sometimes that has groundings in reality. And a lot of the time it's you know, like a powerfully projective, exaggerated kind of mythic space, right? Flown off into mythic space. So, so having noted that I was getting hit with a lot of projection, I basically made the decision a couple of different times, I'm gonna pull this back. So one was when I was living alone and writing, uh, and I just decided I'm, I'm not gonna do this, I'm going to instead integrate. I'm gonna integrate this energy into myself. And I talked a little bit about this before, and I saw that start to, frankly, make me weird, right? Uh, you know, the point was, if we want to use the Jungian terminology, that I had not sufficiently really developed 
my, my masculine side, such as it was, before I decided, right? I, I was running away from those energies. I was running away from those aspects of myself. And that was what was motivating things. And this turned up all over the place in my dream life. But the actual example I want to talk about today was from a, a later second instance. So this was after, again, um, you know, another disastrous uh, relationship. In this case, the disastrous relationship was one... <laughs> um, so I often tell my clients and students that the middle phase of therapy is the most frustrating phase because that's the phase where you have a really good grasp actually on the dynamics of your complex. You understand the cycle, you know the story that it's telling, you've seen it, you've done it a few times, you've run through it. You know how it works, but you're still powerless to intervene or nearly powerless, okay? This was one of those cases. So I met somebody in a course uh, it was massively accelerated, right, for both of us. Um, it was very, you know, it was really good, really got us high, right? Spending time together got us high. There was a lot of charge there. And like hours and hours and hours and hours of uninterrupted talking and often really deep talking. And it was powerful experience. And nevertheless, there were some, some red flags for me, right, um, in the whole situation. And uh, so, you know, I went into my analyst and I said, I'm describing this young woman and blah, 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 blah. And he says, uh, at one point, he's like, oh, that's great. It sounds like you're falling in love. And I say, it's not great, man. It's a fucking disaster. Uh, and, and he sort of goes like, why? Um, I'm surprised actually. So maybe he was just playing ball with me, but anyway, uh, but playing ball with me. That was unintentional. Is that a Freudian slip? Maybe. Anyway, so he sort of cocks his head and says, like, why? And I'm like, why? Okay, look, here's what's going to happen. This is going to happen, then 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 this is going to happen, and then it's all going to explode and it's going to end in tears and heartbreak. That's what's going to happen. And I said, and the thing is, I know that and I'm going to do it anyway. And that's what I did. <laughs> it's exactly what I did. Why? Because the enchantment, the fascination, the magic, the magic feels so good. That projection state feels so good. It drags you into this mythic larger than life space. It energizes you and focuses you, right? Uh, and, and I mean that literally, like you literally require less sleep. That's empirically established, right? You're focused in the sense that you're obsessive, but it energizes and focuses you, gives you purpose, right? All of your genetic machinery starts to just click in and be like, I know where this is going, right? And and on top of that, it had, of course, an elaborated, you know, intellectual and emotional context and so on and so forth. It, the charge just felt so good, right? And I, and I wanted it uh, in, in that level, even though rationally I was aware that this was about to be a, a train wreck. And indeed, it was a train wreck, okay, in, in the end. Uh, I mean, it was great for a couple months. Uh, but then it came apart. When it came apart, it came apart explosively. And I spent like, uh, I don't know, two weeks of my Christmas vacation, more or less sleeping 20 hours a day and spent the rest of the time just listening to Eminem on repeat and playing Angry Birds. Uh, thank you, Angry Birds, for getting me through that one. Anyway, the long story short there was, right, like the, I allowed the projection to happen. I allowed it to happen. And so in the aftermath of that, I was like, okay, enough of this. Like, I'm not playing this game anymore. I'm not about to be, you know, shoved around by my complexes. I'm not about to be pushed around by my complexes and, right, and my projections. So I endeavored that I was, I needed to spend some time, you know, doing inner work, right? That was my theory. It's not a bad idea. But the point is, I was like, anytime I feel the faint tingle of a projection starting to project onto, uh, you know, a... a a human, uh, I'm going to pull it back. I'm going to defuse it, pull it back. Now, there are downsides to that. You know, if you really want to drain all the magic and enchantment from your world, that's what you risk doing if you lance every projection before it has a chance to root. And so you can see, uh, it's kind of a paradox there, right? You don't want to be dragged along by the nose, by these feelings, but at the same time, if you completely remove them, things get awfully flat, right? And so it's about finding some kind of synthetic third relationship, but I was not there yet. So instead, I just started pulling my projections back. And it's like, I can do this. I can do it. Ba, 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 ba. So then something really interesting happened. I'm on the subway one day, okay? And um, 
it's helpful for me to say that one of the complexes that I've worked with and wrestled with, okay, for a number of years, okay, is my Superman complex. Okay, and my Superman complex goes really far back, you know, like really far back, you know, uh, at five, my grandparents brought me a Superman suit back from England. And like, I wore it under my clothes quite frequently so that I could be at the ready. I'm a very unlikely looking Superman, right? I'm, a, I'm an extremely pink ginger Superman uh, and kind of a pudgy Superman as a kid. But nevertheless, right? The point was that from the age of maybe two or something, Superman occupied this huge space in my mind. You draw maps of the solar system, which included Krypton, which shows frankly, a very uh, poor sense of, um, uh, of uh, astrogation. But anyway, um, okay, so Superman. And we'll, we'll talk more about Superman as goes because Superman has been a significant figure for me in terms of connecting to the self. But Superman as an aspect, okay, comes with some downsides, okay? One of which I'm actually gonna talk about, I had planned to put it in a lecture this week, but it will go into a lecture next week around sort of ambition. One of the things about the Superman complex is that it drives me into a, you can do it. And not just you can do it, but if nobody else can do it and you can, you must, right? Which means that it plays into ambition and that's great because it gets me involved in things, but it also, gets me over involved in things and it gives me a sense of responsibility for things that is not always frankly reasonable, right? It also makes sometimes perfectionistic demands of me. So uh, I had an instance a couple of years ago where I needed to back off on a commitment that I had made, right? And, and it worked out fine, right? In fact, everybody gained from, from me stepping away in a sense. I, f I found, I, I worked it out is the point, right? There was no losers really. And it, this thing still hammered me. It's like, but you said you would do it, so you must. You said you would do it, so you must. And I'm like, yeah, I know I said I would do it, but that was a mistake. Uh, and it's like, well, you're not allowed to make a mistake. And, and I'm like, what do you mean I'm not allowed to make a mistake? Like, other people are allowed to make mistakes. And it said, yes, yes, of course, you know, to err is human. And it's like, so then I put it together. It's like, oh, I see. Like, the demand here is that I be superhuman. Now, there is a thing that attaches, because we'll talk more about Superman later, but there is a thing that attaches to the Superman complex, which is the Lois Lane complex. And what can we say about Lois Lane? Lois Lane is very sharp. She's a career woman. She's uh, cold, but clever. Um, although weirdly, they always have her not being able to spell now. I think that's such an interesting thing. But anyway, you know, she's driven. Uh, you know, she's a, a modern woman, right? Smart, quick. And it is true. I definitely find those, it's an appealing set of traits. But she's also cold. And she's cold in a particular kind of way, which is to say that she's so warm to Superman. To the superhuman, she's warm. But to Clark, to Clark Kent, if you're not super familiar with, I assume everybody is kind of familiar with Superman. But you know, Clark Kent is Superman's alter ego and he's a schlub, right? He's a schlub. And the point is, Clark loves Lois. Lois loves Superman, right? So Clark kind of can't be Clark. He can never be Clark, okay? And so this particular complex, right, a certain attraction to women who are a little cool and seem to, they, they make me want to be super. They make me want to super perform and not just morally, but in terms of like, right? Okay, so... So this was the sort of thing I was getting involved in, and it's the sort of thing where I was pulling my projections away. So I'm in the subway. Those of you who are already heard this story can just fast forward. But I'm in the subway. And, uh, and at the time, Global News had a new anchor woman, okay, who, who they had, um, I guess, promoted uh, in the news team from uh, out west someplace, Alberta, maybe. Anyway, and... I saw this poster of this woman and she was an attractive woman, a um, little older than me, uh, really, really piercingly blue eyes. Um, you know, attractive, not gorgeous, but very attractive, okay? And she had this sort of professional, you know, flatness. And I looked at this, I looked at this poster, which was in the subway, and all of a sudden I started getting like, you know, like Twitter pated. I started getting, you know, like a little bit, um, jumped up. And so like, I'm sneaking glances at this thing in the way that we sneak glances, right? You know, you find somebody attractive and you sort of want to look, but you don't want to be creep, but you want to look and you want to look not just to see what they look like, but because you want to sort of drink the image, right? You're like, it's, it's, 
just to, to get the image into your eyes or something, right? Um, but simultaneously, there is also this quality of like, right, when somebody is really attractive, right? Even if you can look at them without being creepy, there's this, this power to them. It's almost overwhelming, right? And I started getting that. So I'm sort of sneaking glances and looking away and sneaking glances. And meanwhile, I'm moving down the subway platform to be closer to this poster. And my imagination has gone into overdrive. All of a sudden I'm imagining, you know, wow, maybe if I went out west, we could be together. It's, I do not know this person. So after a couple of minutes of this, I suddenly catch myself, right? Because it's pretty weird. And I catch myself and I'm like, what am I doing? Now, at this point, those of you in the class who didn't already think that I was nuts probably do think that I was nuts. But I use this as a very specific, specific example because Look at what happened in terms of projection, right? I plugged kind of every available hole that I could find, right? Every, right? I did not allow my anima projection to settle on any human, no human woman. If I meet a human woman, nope, 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 right? So I'm hoarding it. And thus, I'm getting this concentration of what happens, it slips out. It slips out where it can, and it attaches to the first object that it can attach to that sort of meets the criteria. And it did, right? This thing totally met the criteria. This, the beauty, the severity, the coldness of the gaze, the fact that she was a news anchor. It was just Lois Lane. This picture was just Lois Lane. And so unable to attach to anything in the environment, this thing eventually just, woof, right? Found a way. Now that complex is being tricksy and finding a way is a thing you'll see a lot, okay? People who grapple with addictions and who have complexes around their addictions, often, right, the addictions will get quite tricky with them. And if they allow themselves to be talked into it and possessed a little bit by the addiction, the addiction will let them get tricky with other people. That's why, right, addicts who, who are really seriously dealing with addiction um, often have, frankly, a reputation for being sort of untrustworthy a lot of the time, right? Because they will just say what they need to say. But this is sort of a consequence. First, that thing tells them what it, whatever it needs to tell them to get them to do what it wants, you see? Like it, it whispers thoughts and eventually they'll cave in. You deserve it. This has been a hard day. You need to just this one time. We'll do it to prove that we don't need to do it, et cetera, okay? And it'll look, it'll probe at the defenses until it can find a way. That's one of the things that makes addiction and compulsion so hard to tackle is that there's a kind of a living intelligence there. Well, it was the same with this anima projection, right? There was a kind of living intelligence to it. And when I stopped every hole in the dam on projection, instead, right, it just like went to this thing. Now I caught it and quickly, but like, unless you think I'm just totally nuts, okay, what I'm describing here is not some unique power or faculty. It was an unusual circumstance because my, you know, Jungian training and whatever such as it was, right, had me driving myself towards a particular kind of constrained state of mind. And so as an experiment, we got an unusual result, but the result is telling. I mean, that's what experimental design is for, not that I did it on purpose, but that's what experimental design is for, right? You, you constrain conditions until you get something really striking. And that makes something clear. And what became so clear in this moment was the way it was projective because it couldn't be about the poster, right? I didn't know this woman. I didn't know her. And the entire imaginative elaboration that came out of it was just conjured whole cloth inside me. Being able to see that process at work on something totally inanimate like a poster was extremely telling as a kind of scientific experiment because it subtracted out all of the normal human factors where we are inclined to attribute those properties to them. And that, that's projection in a nutshell. Okay, now I've only got a few minutes left. So I wanna reiterate, watch Marwan call. And something that I will say about this, and I'll talk more about this as we go, is the way that projection functions um, in other domains, particularly in the domain of play, okay? Now we can see this in a bunch of places. And a thing that I talk about um, in this class and also my other class. So some of you that were in hypothesis of the unconscious will, will be familiar with this, but I can remember what I call the day my toys died, okay? I was about 12 years old. I had the action figures and stuff set up on the couch. I was prepared to play with my toys, 11 or 12. And, uh, and I'm moving the toys, right? I'm doing the thing, but for some reason they're not coming to life, right? 
There was no animation. It wasn't working. And I became very aware of this, very frustrated. I was trying to play, and yet I wasn't able to project myself into, right? Because when kids play with toys, they're not making those decisions on a conscious level. They project into the space, and then that, 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 right? Now, that insight that for some reason my toys had sort of died, I'm sure is a strong motivator in my lifelong pursuit of role-playing games, which allow me to sort of re-enter an animated space, right? Re-enter an imaginative play space collaboratively with people in a way that the, the figures take on a life of their own, okay? And so I'm, you know, it's not like I've done a huge amount of work around this, but I imagine that the two things are quite closely related, okay? But what you'll see is that there's also a relationship there to, to other things. That space, which children cross so easily where they bring their toys to life, okay? It's the same space that Jung crossed when he made his little town, and it's the same space you'll see in Marwin Call. And we'll talk more about that. I'm out of time. So we'll talk more about that. I'm gonna limit to one hour this week because I'm trying not to, to pile on you guys, and I recognize that I am asking you to do a fair bit of reading and commentary and stuff. So prioritize a couple of things. One, if you haven't watched your peers' presentations, please watch your peers' presentations. I will ask that they will show you the same respect, but also the presentations are really good, so, so you should watch them. I think you'll find them interesting. That's thing one. Thing two, watch Marwin Call. If you haven't, watch it. It's probably the most important sort of film piece we'll do this year uh, as a documentary, and I think you will immediately see why. Um, that's thing two. And thing three, if you have not yet, please respond on the discussion boards. Try to keep your responses briefer couple of paragraphs if you can. I don't want to squelch enthusiasm, but I also don't want to scare people off. Um, and very importantly, make sure that you go to the quizzes section on Quirkus and fill out some peer feedback after you watch the presentations. Okay, so I will see you guys tonight at six on Zoom. And uh, yeah, I look forward to talking to you then. And um, yeah, next week we'll be back to presentations, but also uh, a couple of hours of lecture. I'm, deliberately constraining things for now. Okay, good. So I'll see you all later.